Very good. If you'll take your Bible and turn to the book of Acts, chapter 26, the book of Acts, chapter 26, and we began this particular chapter on last Sunday. We ended chapter 25. We entered into chapter 26. Uh, the Apostle Paul has been uh, before several different individuals and groups before his own people, uh, the Jews. He gave defense there. He gave testimony there. Uh, he's given testimony uh, before the Jewish council, before the Sanhedrin. Uh, you remember Claudius, the chief captain, he, he couldn't accuse him of, of anything, and he just wanted to be done with him, so he sent him up to Felix, to the governor, up in Caesarea. And uh, there was another trial that was held there uh, before Felix. Again, Paul has an opportunity to give testimony. Felix comes under conviction and says, I'll hear you again, Paul, when it's more convenient. And we talked about Felix's procrastination. As far as we know, Felix never did respond to the gospel message. And you remember he was relieved and Festus was put in his place. And Festus tried to get in good with the religious leaders after he came to Caesarea and went down to Jerusalem. And you remember the only thing that was on their minds... Paul had been in Felix's palace for two years, and the only thing that was on their minds was killing Paul. If it meant blackmail, fine. If it meant blackmail on Festus, fine. Whatever the case, but Festus didn't give in. He wouldn't allow Paul to be brought to Jerusalem. And uh, you remember that <clears throat> finally, uh, through it all, uh, Paul realized that things were not looking good that he was going to be forced to go to Jerusalem. And so he appealed, if you remember in chapter 25, he appealed to Caesar. And as soon as he did that, it took it out of the hands of everyone. And uh, that's exactly what was going to happen. He was going to go uh, to Rome. And we find out that while that was going on, at the end of chapter 25, Agrippa comes and Bernice comes uh, to see Festus. And uh, Festus uh, speaks with Agrippa. He sees it as an opportunity uh, to be able to lay some charge, Agrippa being king of the Jews, and uh, to give an opportunity there to come to an understanding uh, of how he could charge Paul because he couldn't send him to Nero, to Caesar, without a charge. And uh, uh, this just wasn't working out for Festus. And Paul, you remember, he saw this as another opportunity. Paul saw it as an opportunity to give the gospel. Uh, that's always what Paul saw an opportunity. No matter the situation, no matter if people thought he was crazy, uh, no matter if people uh, mocked him, no matter if he was in change, no matter uh, if he was in jail, no matter if they were going to kill him, uh, Paul understood something that I think each of us as believers need to come to the place. He realized that he was expendable for the cause of Jesus Christ. And that's how he viewed his life. And I... Uh, I believe we can see that because of how bold he was. Uh, at every turn, at every corner, uh, he was bold for the Lord Jesus Christ. So as far as the main characters and what's going on in this narrative, at this point, you have Paul, who's going to be giving his testimony here in chapter 26. We're going to get into that tonight. We're going to get into the very heart of it, really. And uh, you see Festus, and he's sitting there, and he sees as an opportunity to get an accusation to send with Paul to Rome. And Agrippa, he's there, and really, honestly, Agrippa is just curious. Uh, he's just curious. He's heard a lot about Paul, and so he's curious to hear what Paul has to say. And so that's the setting when we come to this particular passage here in Acts chapter 26. You remember Paul has already said at the beginning, he's, he's got the attention of everybody that's there. Lots of people there. Remember, there was all kinds of pomp and circumstance, and everybody was all in their long, flowing garments and, and uh, arrayed with the crown and, and everything that, uh, that would go on in a big ceremony, all the, all the fantasy that you can imagine that would be taking place. That was what was going on there. And in comes Paul, and some probably thought, you know, this is, we're going to have to listen to this guy. I mean, really, what, what can this, this bald-headed, short preacher uh, have to tell us. And Paul is happy to be there. He says there in verse 2, he says, I think myself happy. Now remember, he, there was no legal, uh, there was no law stating that Paul had to do this. 
I mean, he could have said, look, I, I've appealed to Caesar. I don't have to say anything else. I'm done. Send me to Caesar. But he didn't do that. He said, I think myself happy there in verse 2. And he, he says, I think myself happy. Why? Because I shall answer for myself this day before thee touching all things whereof I am accused of the Jews. I'm, I'm going to be able to, to give you my testimony is really what he's saying. Verse 3 especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. Now, as any good preacher, he says, don't expect this to be short. Right? He said, hear me patiently. Hear me patiently. And he gets up there and he, uh, 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 and he says, I'm going to have an opportunity to answer for myself. And then in verse 4, he begins to give his answer. He says, my manner of life from my youth which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. And he's going to begin, and we're going to read down through here. We're going to go down through verse number 18 this evening. And we're going to find out the Apostle Paul in his testimony here, third time, third time in this book that he gives his salvation testimony. We learn something about his salvation testimony in each different account of it. Uh, some, some more light is shed on his testimony. I think about what he's doing here in chapter 25, what he has done, and what he's doing in chapter 26. And there, there's, there's some things that are going on, again, under the surface here, because uh, what Paul is doing, he has motivation for. What is the motivation? The motivation that Paul has in giving his testimony here before Agrippa, why he's so happy to do it, is because he wants Agrippa to see the transforming power of the gospel. Can I tell you something? The, the, the most amazing thing, the thing that stands out the most among a lost world is you and myself transformed life. We can give all the facts, and we ought to give the facts, and people ought to come to a clear understanding of what the gospel is, but let me tell you something. I believe that Agrippa understood the promises. He understood what was there in the Old Testament. He understood the prophecies concerning the Messiah. He understood what was being said about Jesus Christ. He understood all of those things. So it wasn't necessarily that he had to give him all of that over again. What he wanted Agrippa to see is, I want you to understand, Agrippa, that I was in the same position as you are, and Jesus Christ transformed my life. He transformed my life. Now, I want you to hold your place here because we're going to deal with this, but I want you to go quickly, if you would. I think that in Paul's dealings with uh, the Corinthians in just a few verses, he gives us why uh, he's dealing with Agrippa and all those that are present there that day in, in, in uh, uh, Caesarea. He, he gives us a little model of what he's doing. His motivation was to show Agrippa. He was focusing in on Agrippa because that's who he was giving the testimony to. He was showing him, I want you to see, the transforming work of the gospel. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse number 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? Say it out loud. He is a new creature. You know what he wanted to tell Agrippa? He says, Agrippa, I want you to know something. This is not Saul of Tarshish in front of you. This is Paul. This is one who has been changed by the power of the gospel. He wanted, to, he wanted him to understand uh, uh, the change that Christ has made. He said there in verse 17, all things, at 2 Corinthians 5, 17, all things are passed away, though all things are become new. Now look at verse number 18. Here's his ministry. That was his motivation, a changed life. Here's his ministry. And all things are of God who hath reconciled. What does that mean? That means to bring back into proper adjustment. And the Bible says that all things are of God who hath reconciled, bring into right adjustment us who were sinners, in other words, to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So to bring into proper adjustment. Now, when you see that mention, the, the New Testament always uses it in reference to men. Men need to be reconciled. God doesn't need to be reconciled. Men need to be reconciled. Proper adjustment. And so, what, what, is, what is going on? God has given the gospel message so men can be brought into proper adjustment with God. Look at verse number 19. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling 
the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. In other words, we have responsibility. We are to carry it to the world. The very next verse, what does he say we are? Verse 20, Now then, we are ambassadors. We represent the government of God in a foreign land. That's what we are. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you, did beg of you, did implore of you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. You're here in Christ's stead. Jesus is not walking on the earth anymore. You're here in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. Be ye brought into adjustment to God. And so we must be consistently engaged in this ministry of reconciliation, rightly adjusting people to God. And when should we do it? When should it take place? Well, look there at verse 21. For it hath made him, Jesus, to be sent for us, who knew no sin, Jesus knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. Now here's when it should be done. Here's the moment, Okay? Uh, The motivation was what? A changed life. The ministry was what? A ministry of reconciliation, bringing people into proper adjustment with God. And when should that that happen? At what moment should that take place? Well, look at verse 1 of chapter 6. We then as workers together with him beseech you. I mean, Paul's using this word over and over again. Beg you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I... Uh, uh, succored thee, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And so the Apostle Paul says, my motivation for giving my testimony, look, I don't have to do it. I have no legal reason that I have to be out here, but I want you to know I'm happy to do it. Why? Because I want Agrippa, and I want Bernice, and I want everybody gathered here, Festus and everybody, and all their pomp, and all their circumstances, and all the other... Uh, uh, people that are gathered there to hear, however many may have been there, maybe thousands would have been there to hear, whatever the case may have been, Paul says, I want you to see something, that I stand before you a changed man. And the reason why I appeal to Caesar, the reason why uh, 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 I've suffered all these things that I've suffered up to this point is because Jesus Christ has changed my life. So that was his motivation. My ministry, what, what he has given me to do. You remember he said uh, 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 on that road to Damascus, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And you remember what Jesus said? Arise. It should be told thee what thou shalt do. And it, we find out later in chapter 9 that God told him what was going to happen, what was going to take place. And so he says, this is my ministry. This is what God has given me to do. He's given me the ministry of going uh, to whoever I can go to and give them the good news of the gospel so they can be rightly adjusted to God. When do you need to take care of that, Paul? Now. In other words, there's a sense of urgency. Now is the time for action. Can I tell you something? that now is the time for action for you and I. We are only guaranteed now. We're only guaranteed now. Now is the time for action. You remember what Agrippa said to Paul, and we're not going to get all the way there tonight, but in verse 28 of chapter 26 of the book of Acts, remember what Agrippa said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Agrippa put his finger on the goal and objective that should be in the heart and life of every Christian. And that is to see those who do not know Christ come to Christ. That should be the goal. And if we're not careful, and I, I'll, I'll put myself right in there as well, and if we'll be honest, we can all put ourselves in there, we can become so complacent in our church life that we forget about a world of people that are bound for a devil's hell. We forget about it. We, we, we become content. And by the way, all these things that I'm about to mention are good things, necessary things, things that we ought to be doing. But we can become so content in our fellowship. We can become so content in our learning. We can become so content in, in all the other things that we do and forget that there's a world out there that's without Jesus Christ. God help us. I think I told you the story about the man that went to the restaurant in a major city And he was there, and he was eating in that restaurant. 
And as he was sitting there, he was sitting by the window, and people were walking back and forth, and there was two little, two little street children there, two little street urchins, and they were there, and they were looking into the window, and they were hungry. And they just watched that man as he, as he ate. And that man got upset, and he called the waiter. He said, waiter, come here. He said, I want you to, I want you to pull the curtain on this window. So the waiter, he pulled the curtain. But you know something? Those two children were still out there. And sometimes we get that way. We'd rather not see what's going on in our world. We'd rather forget about it. And we want to pull the curtain. But let me tell you something. There's still a world that's out there who needs Jesus Christ. They're still there. God, help us not to be too content. God, help us not to be too satisfied and too, too, too smug in, in, in our church life. You see, when God saved you, He saved you for a purpose. He saved you to send you back out. So we're talking about preacher. We look at verse number 17 of Acts chapter 26. Delivering thee from the people, from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee. Who's talking? God's talking. Who's He talking to? He's talking to Paul. He said, I've sent you out. I've sent you out. I, I, I think about some of the prayers that Paul prayed. I still have in my heart and mind to do a maybe a series of messages on the prayers of the Apostle Paul. Ephesians chapter 6. Look there with me if you would for just a moment. Here's a prayer that we ought to pray for one another. Ephesians chapter 6, just two verses, verse 19 and 20. The Bible says, and for me, Paul's, Paul's asking the church there at Ephesus, he's asking those believers, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. For which I am a what? I'm an ambassador. There's that word again. I'm a representative of God in this world. An ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul said, would you pray? Would you pray that a door of utterance would be open that I could speak boldly for Jesus Christ? You know, it would be a good thing to pray that for yourself. It would be a good thing to pray that for everybody that you know as a believer that God would give us opportunity, that we would open our mouth boldly to speak. Uh, notice what Paul said to, to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 5. Now, now, Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says in verse number 5, he says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. In other words, he says, Timothy, if you're going to if you're going to be able to make full proof of, of your ministry, you're going to have to do the work of an evangelist. Uh, some people say, well, I wish God would give me the gift of evangelism. Do you know something? No one has the gift of evangelism. No one has the gift of evangelism. You know why? Because every one of us have a command to evangelize. It's not a gift. It's a command. It's a command. And that's something that we all should be doing. Is telling us about Jesus Christ. So, for Paul, the task was clear. The motivation? A changed life. The ministry? The ministry of reconciliation. Getting people properly adjusted to God. And the moment was now. It was now. That was the task that was clear. And so here it is, and Paul's been given many opportunities, and he sees each opportunity, and so here he is before Agrippa. You remember last week we talked about uh, uh, kind of the setting of Paul's testimony and the situation of his testimony is, as, a, as a Festus and Agrippa were communicating back and forth and Festus was recounting all that had happened between him and Felix, uh, uh, or with Paul from Felix on. And, and then we began to talk about the start of Paul's testimony and his readiness as we just read in verses 2 and 3. And, and Paul thought that Agrippa would be an objective person. He wouldn't be clouded by the thinking of the Sanhedrin because he himself was predominantly Roman in his thinking. He grew up in Rome. He was educated in Rome. And so he saw a, a great opportunity to present the gospel to Agrippa. And he wanted to show Agrippa the change that Jesus Christ had made, the one of the great motives of evangelism. Remember, we said a moment ago, Agrippa didn't need to hear the facts. He knew them. Say, so how do you know that? Look at verse 26, chapter 26, verse 26. For the king knoweth of these things. Paul said, you know what I'm talking about. Well, how do you know? Before him also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from thee. 
For this thing was not done in a corner. This matter of Jesus Christ, it was not done in a corner. It was evident. It was known to all. So, what he did need to hear, what Agrippa did need to hear, was what Christ had done in Paul's life and could do in any man's life and in others in that time's life through the power of his resurrection. What had taken place in his life. So, uh, Paul begins. And what does he begin with? Well, we read verse 4 just a moment ago. And we find out Paul begins to give his testimony. He talks about his manner of life. Remember what he was? He, he said he, he, in Philippians he was a, a, a Pharisee of the Pharisees as touching the law, blameless. I mean, he knew it backwards and forwards. Uh, he was educated in Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel. Uh, uh, he was uh, this, the straightest, the, the, the strictest sect uh, uh, of the Pharisees. That's where Paul was. He was a zealous Jew. And why was he explaining all this to Agrippa? Because he wanted to understand the miraculous change that had happened. Look there at verse 4. He said, My manner of life from my youth, which was the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning. In other words, he's saying, Hey, there's people here that knew me from the beginning. If they would testify, they would speak that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. This is how zealous... I was. I didn't believe there was anything else but Judaism. Uh, I stood for it. I, I, I mean, I stood for it to the hilt. How much so? Look at verse 6. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. Well, what was the hope? What was the hope that God had made to the Jews? Well, the hope was the Messiah. The promised one who would come and deliver Israel, the nation of Israel, has lived in bondage for years and years and years in Egypt. It had been in bondage from time to time all the way up into that uh, time in which the Babylonians and the Assyrians took away the, uh, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. They had lived in bondage all the way up through Rome from that period. They had experienced a little measure uh, uh, of freedom from Saul and David and Solomon. And during the divided kingdom, they had experienced a little bit of freedom, but then, of course, because of their sin, they were driven into, into captivity and into bondage. And now, the Roman eagle flew over them. They had known fighting. They had known slavery. They had known struggling. And the resurrection was their hope, the hope that the Messiah would deliver Israel. He would set up His kingdom. He would raise those believing Jews from the dead uh, uh, even Job testified of it. If you look back in Job chapter 19, uh, many believe the book of Job to be the oldest book in the Bible. The book of Job, Job chapter 19, and verse number 26. Uh, notice what Job testified. He believed, he believed in resurrection. Job 19, 26. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Job said, this is not the end. This is not the end. There is coming a resurrection. And Paul is relating the truth of that, the hope of Israel. And he says, this is why. Agrippa, you want to know why I'm standing here before you? Let me tell you why I'm standing here before you. I'm standing here before you because I'm being called in question of the hope of Israel. That's why. The hope of resurrection. I'm being condemned for what Jews have believed all uh, throughout their existence, throughout their history. Verse number 7, Unto which promise our twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. In other words, Paul said, I didn't invent this. I didn't come up with this. This is not my idea. All twelve tribes of Israel agree to this. They're still together. Uh, they're still unified on this. Paul says they, they still earnestly hope for the coming of the Messiah. These Pharisees that stand here this day, they are looking for that same hope. They believe that same hope. But notice what he said in the end again of verse 7, For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I'm accused of the Jews. Verse 8, Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead. Now, Agrippa would have to say that he didn't have a problem believing that. He didn't have a problem with resurrection. 
But Paul wanted to know, why do I have to suffer abuse and condemnation for simply believing in the resurrection? Pharisees believe in resurrection. Agrippa was probably thinking, well, you're right, Paul. We believe in resurrection, but we don't believe that Jesus is the resurrected Messiah. Well, this didn't come as any shock to Paul. He anticipated that response, of course, and he knew the Jewish leaders would uh, would say the same thing. By the way, one of the most startling acts of rejection in all of Scripture is that the Jews and the high priests, the religious leaders of that day, rejected the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right in the face of it, right in the proof of it, look back in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. They willfully rejected, in spite of proof. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, look back there in Matthew 28 again, verse number 11. Matthew 28, verse number 11. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priest all things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers. Now if you've learned anything through our study of Acts, you know this, that Jews hate Romans. They hate that Roman eagle flying over their head. They hate that. So why in the world Would they want to give them money? Why would they want to do that? The Bible says they gave large sums unto the soldiers, unto the Roman soldiers, verse 13, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. Why did they do it? They did it for bribery. They wanted to start the rumor. By the way, if they were asleep, how could they possibly testify the disciples stole the body? Sleep with one eye open, I guess, right? The chief priest bought the soldiers off, verse 14. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money. If it came to Pilate's ears, in other words, we'll persuade him and secure you. Verse 15, so they took the money and did as they were taught. And this thing is commonly reported among the Jews unto this day. Paul says, I want to know, why am I standing under condemnation for what has been believed throughout the history of the nation of Israel? That's what I want to know. Paul seeking justice. Look at verse number 9 of Acts chapter 26. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Paul says, Agrippa, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You believe in resurrection, just not Jesus' resurrection. You don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. I know what you're thinking. By the way, Agrippa, I want you to know something. I used to think like you thought. I used to live like you lived, Agrippa. I used, to, I, I used to think that very same thing. If there's anything that disturbed Paul in his conscience, it was the fact that he, at a point in his life, as a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he tracked down Christians uh, uh, to uh, incarcerate them or to put them to death. He compelled them to blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ. And anything that lingered in his mind, it was those things. He said, how do you know that? Well, look, look in 1 Timothy. Look at his first letter to Timothy. And notice what he said to him. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verse number 13. Notice what Paul says. He said, who was before, talking about himself, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly. In unbelief. The grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And what's Paul say? Of whom I am chief. I'm the chief one. I'm the chief one. I, I'm the one that had Christians compelled to turn their back on Jesus, to, to blaspheme His holy name. And if they wouldn't do it, to execute them. He said, I verily thought within myself I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 10, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. That's an interesting word, voice. It refers, it refers to a little pebble that was used in the Sanhedrin to cast a vote. And Paul saying, I cast my vote I cast it with those religious leaders. I cast it against those Christians to put them to death. That's what he's talking about. 
In verse 11, I punished them off in every synagogue, compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Agrippa, Paul saying, I'm condemned for believing what all Jews believe. However, I know something, Agrippa. I know it's for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know it's for His sake that that's why it's coming to pass. He moves on to the high point of his testimony in verse number 12. He's telling Agrippa, he said, Agrippa, listen, I understand where you're at. I know where you're at. I thought the same way you thought. This Jesus, I thought he was a blasphemer. But let me tell you something, something amazing happened in my life. God changed me. He transformed me. Here's the high point of his testimony in verse 12. Whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest. Verse 13, At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking to me, saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. In other words, he says, Agrippa, I want you to know something. God Himself stopped me on the way to Damascus, and Jesus Christ, whom I blasphemed, Jesus Christ, who I said was a blasphemer, Jesus Christ appeared to me. And I can tell you something, He's not dead. He's alive. He's alive. And He spoke to me on the road to Damascus, and He said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? In other words, He said, Saul, why are you fighting a losing battle? Why are you trying to win against all odds? You can't win. You can't win. You see, Paul was fighting something that he was supposed to be submitting to. You can imagine there wasn't a person on the face of the earth as miserable as Paul was fighting against what he was supposed to be submitting to. Verse number 15, what does the Bible say? And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Verse 14 says, hard for thee to kick against the pricks like that old like that old cow kicking against that prod. And it wasn't going to work. It wasn't going to give. It wasn't going to move. You're kicking against it. You can't win. And verse number 16, after Paul had said, what wilt thou have me to do? Verse 16, but arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. And here it is. He would give a title to the message tonight. It's simply this, to make thee a minister and a witness. A minister and a witness. A servant. A servant and a witness. The Bible says here that God sent him. He sent him. Say, so where does it say that at? Look at verse 17. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles into whom now I send thee. If you find the original word there, it's the same word that we use for the English word apostle. It means one who has been sent. One who has been sent. That's what it means. I still believe God calls and sends people to the ends of the earth with the gospel. He still calls and sends people. He says, I've been made a minister, a servant. I've been made a witness, one who sees something and one who tells about it. Do you know that your testimony and my testimony comes out of our own experience? What's happened in our life? Here's the cycle we're to follow. We are, we are saved, and then we are sent out back into the world. We're saved and we're sent back out. I wonder, let me ask you a question. Do you look at your job that way? Do you look at the opportunities you have out in the workforce? Tomorrow is a holiday. Many of you probably have the day off. But when you go back to work on Tuesday, do you look at that situation that way? Recognize that you've been commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ into that mission field, that group of people, to take the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the motivation to show people a changed life. The ministry is the ministry of reconciliation. It's the ministry of helping them to properly be adjusted to God. And the moment to do it is now to transform, to see them transform from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of His dear Son. You see, every last one of us, every last one of us are to be a witness. Do you know something that you can touch the world that you live in to a greater degree than I ever could? And you'll touch it in a way that I never can. 
where you're at. You have contacts. You have people that you're around and you influence that I will never be able to influence. But God has placed them there for you to influence. You see, you're exactly what Paul said. You're an ambassador. And committed to you is the same ministry that's committed to Paul. It's the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, we've been called to bring people into a proper adjustment with God. Let me ask you a question. How are we going to do that? Well, Paul doesn't leave us in the dark. The last verse we're going to look at is verse number 18. But I want you to see there's six things, and we're going to see them real quickly. Six things here that Paul gives us. First of all, look at verse 18 to open their eyes. What's that conviction? This is the starting point of the gospel. The starting point of the gospel. The first thing you have to do with lost people is what? Is bring them to the realization that they are lost to help them to understand that they are blind. They're blind. Israel was blind. They were blind to the truth. Matthew 15, 14. And when the Word of God comes to men, then suddenly man sees what he never saw before, and that is that he is a sinner before God, and the Word of God opens men's eyes through the Holy Spirit of God, and it convicts the world, the Bible says in John 16 11, of what? Of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Isn't that what Paul did to Felix? When he shared his testimony with Felix, he spoke to him about all three of those things. He spoke to him of his sin, He spoke to him of the righteousness that God demands, and he spoke to him of judgment that is to come. Well, you know something? I'm glad that my mother took the Bible as a five-year-old boy, and she spoke of those same things in a very simple way. She spoke of those same things. And you know what? I realized something. I realized that I was a sinner. I realized that Jesus Christ died for me, that He was holy and He was righteous. And because I was a sinner, I couldn't get into His heaven. And where I was headed was a devil's hell. And I looked up and I said, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I believe that I'm a sinner. And I received Jesus Christ as Savior. I'll tell you one thing. That's a great motivator. That's a great motivator. Make no mistake about it. Conviction to open their eyes. And then what happens? And to turn them from darkness to life. Well, that's illumination. Because a person without Jesus Christ lives in darkness. Their mind is darkened. They're alienated from God, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4. Why? They are darkened, they are blinded by sin. The God of this world, Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, has blinded them to sin. So our objective is to take the Word of God, to show them their darkness, so the Word of God can remove the scales from their eyes, and they can be illumined by the Spirit of God through the Word of God. Conviction. Illumination. What does the Bible say? To open their eyes to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. You know, you can't evangelize unless you have some truth to reveal. The unsaved man who lives in darkness, who's bound by that darkness, his will is dark, everything is dark. And salvation, Paul, look, Paul's trying to get this across to Agrippa. Salvation is a transformation of life. Look, it's not just knowledge. It's not just having knowledge about the facts of the gospel. There's a lot of people who have the facts of the gospel tonight. But they don't know Jesus as Savior. It's never been personal on their behalf. When we find out, he says, from the power of Satan unto God. What's that? Well, that's the transaction. That's, if you will, that's conversion. That's conversion. You have conviction. Conviction is to open their eyes. Illumination to turn them from darkness to light. Conversion is from the power of Satan unto God. Every man who is without and every woman and every boy and every girl who is without Jesus Christ is under the power of Satan. Do you know there's no such thing? People say this, look, my religion, they like to use that term, my religion is my business. Do you know something? It is their business, but it's my business too. And it's your business too. Well, that's being awful rude to people. I'm not talking about being rude. You don't have to be rude to people. You don't have to be rude. Just take them to the Bible. Show them what the Bible... This is what the Bible says. Look, I didn't write it. God wrote it. God wrote it. It is my business. This is the ministry that God has given to me. This is what God has called me to do. If we're not careful, we allow this old world to lull us to sleep with tolerance 
But we need to say, this is what God in heaven has given me to do. God help us, this is a ministry that we have. People think they're free. They're free to do what they want, but that's not true. You see, they serve one of two gods. They either serve Satan or they serve God. They serve themselves, which is serving Satan, or they serve God. One of those two things. And salvation means that you transfer, you're transferred from Satan's power to God's power. That's a total transformation. In other words, the unsaved man needs more than information about God. He needs Jesus Christ to change his life. More than just information about God. And then what takes place? Well, what did Paul say? There's conviction to open their eyes. There's illumination to turn them from darkness to light. There's conversion from the power of Satan into God that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Boy, aren't you glad when we come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, there's pardon. There's pardon. Can I tell you something? We never get the sentence of not guilty because all of us are guilty. But let me tell you what happens when that blessed transaction takes place. We're pardoned. Now let me tell you what I think is happening here with Agrippa and Bernice. I think by this time, let me tell you something. Paul is striking a chord. Paul is striking a note. And by this time, I think they're probably squirming just a little bit. They're probably getting a little bit uneasy. They're getting a little bit uneasy and maybe Agrippa's thinking, you maybe this wasn't the best idea to hear Paul. Why? Because they knew enough to know what they were in was sin. Well, they knew it from the law. They knew it from the Old Testament. But let me tell you something. As Paul is speaking to them of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, the Spirit of God is convicting their hearts. It's convicting their hearts. And look what's Paul saying. Is Paul being mean? Is Paul being rude? Is Paul going over the top? No. You know what he's really saying? He's telling them the most loving thing he could tell them because he's saying, Agrippa, Agrippa, I know you understand. I know you see this. I know you know what I'm talking about. But I want you to know something, Agrippa. Forgiveness is available. It's available for you. It's available for Bernice. It's available for anyone. You know, that's an exciting message to be able to give. Forgiveness is available to anyone. It doesn't matter how far gone you've gotten. Forgiveness is available to you. We thank God for that. We can turn to so many passages, 1 John 2 and Romans 4, Romans 8. You look them up on your own time. Pardon. He goes on. Notice what he says. Not only is there pardon, but there is an inheritance among them which are sanctified. An inheritance. Sanctified means holy, means set apart. We have a holy inheritance for God. Paul says, Agrippa, I want you to know something. There's an inheritance that is waiting you if you'll come to know Jesus. It's waiting for you. Scott, aren't you glad? Listen, aren't you glad tonight that there's an inheritance waiting for you? Hey, there's a mansion there just over the hilltop. You know what? It's got my name on it. It's the one has got your name on it. An inheritance, holy, Holy, sanctified, set apart. And how is it? By faith, Paul says, by faith that is in me. What does that mean? By faith that is in me. What's Paul talking about? He's saying if unbelievers would receive Christ, salvation would be theirs. And it's only by faith. There's only one way to know the truths of salvation. That's by faith. The simple gospel of Jesus Christ that we're called to preach is exactly what Paul told those Ephesians In chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What's Paul say to Agrippa? He said, Agrippa, I want you to understand something. I was a Jew of all the Jews, of the straightest sect, zealous, fought for Judaism, brought Christians before the judgment seats, made them blaspheme, and if they didn't, killed them. But I want you to know something. One day I was walking on the road to Damascus when a light shone at midday, at noon, brighter than the sun itself. It brought me to my knees and I heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I said, Lord, who art thou? 
And he said, Arise, I've made you a minister, I've made you a witness. He says, I want you to know something, Agrippa. Look in verse number 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. You ought to underline that phrase. I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Let me ask you a question. How could Paul disobey a voice from heaven? If you're saved tonight, how can we disobey a voice from heaven? Say, preacher, I don't know about you. I didn't hear any voices. No, you're right. Peter said, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Do you know that this book is more sure than hearing a voice from heaven? If you're saved tonight, you were saved because somebody got to you with the gospel. And they used this book, they used truth from this book to share the gospel with you and you came to know Jesus Christ. Listen, I want to tell you something. You have a more sure word tonight that what happened in Paul's life is the same thing that has happened in your life if you know Jesus Christ as Savior. And that same ministry of reconciliation that God gave Paul, He's given me and He's given you. We are ambassadors for Christ. We have a responsibility not to be disobedient to the heavenly vision, to the heavenly word that the ministry of reconciliation has been committed to us and that we are carrying it out. Let me ask you a question tonight. Will you be disobedient to that? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We're going to pray together.